Okay, hello. Um, first of all, I noticed that the otter pilots are still not there. I, um, I mean, I haven't done anything to like disable them or anything like that, as far as I know. So if someone's, if people are still trying to use them and they're not working, uh, uh, I probably can't help. You should probably contact Otter, but, <laughs> but at least maybe you could have, let me know what's going on if that's what's happening. Uh, the other thing is, um, that the first writing assignment is due next week, a week from tomorrow. Um, so I wanted to discuss that briefly, I hope. Um, it's, uh, as I said at the beginning of the course, I think this, you know, this is not like a full scale paper, right? This is like a little exercise to do certain things um to do three things basically <laughs> so uh i mean after choosing a, a short passage so there's a, uh seven suggested short passages if you want you could choose a different one um and uh the three things to do are first of all briefly explain in your own words what the argument is supposed to prove and how now, some people looking at some of these passages say there is no argument or it doesn't, it's not supposed to prove something. Um, I mean, first of all, sometimes I think that that's a uh, great right, argument. Philosophers use the word argument just to mean uh, reported demonstration, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean that people are arguing with each other. I, I mean, uh, so I, it might that might sound like it couldn't cause confusion, but actually I found that sometimes it does. So I'm going to mention it. But beyond that, yeah, I think that each one of these is actually does contain an argument and is trying to prove something. But if you can't find it, choose another one. <laughs> is my is my advice. Um, so uh, right. So the first thing. And, you know, as it says here in parentheses, focus only on the argument you have chosen, or the, I guess it should say maybe the passage you've chosen. You shouldn't summarize the rest of the text, right? I mean, you know, uh, you might have to put in a word or two, like to explain how we got to this point or something, but not, there shouldn't be a summary of the rest of the text. Um, number two, Bring up an apparently serious objection to the argument. Um, so, I mean, that is to be good, the objection should be apparently serious, <laughs> right? I mean, that's like the challenge of this assignment because so part three is explain how Descartes would respond to the objection. So like you need an objection that's serious enough that it's interesting to, to know how Descartes would respond to it, but not so serious that you can't think of any response. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you may be able to, to think of objections that you think Des Descartes has no response to, uh, in which case you've refuted Descartes, but that's not a good thing to use for this assignment because you're supposed to be thinking of a response. And I mean, obviously that's a little bit, you know, the idea here is actually that um, it's often easy to think that you have some knockdown objection against some philosophical text you're reading, but the, your first reaction on thinking that should be, oh, what would they say? <laughs> right, so, um, that's what, like, so th this actually, this exercise is an important stage that, this important thing that you do over and over when you interpret a philosophical text, right? Like, as you're reading it, you're thinking, okay, how is this argument supposed to work? Wait, but you think, oh, so I guess he must mean, or I guess they would say X, right? Um, uh, It also says here, this is just, I've added this due to long experience. 
objections based on modern technology or imaginary future technology are discouraged. So discouraged means like it's not prohibited, but it's discouraged. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and then it says, if you think of such an objection, see if you can come up with a similar one that involves only things that Descartes himself knew about or imagined, such as a uh, powerful deceiving demon, right? And like a powerful deceiving demon can do most of the things that the matrix can do or whatever, right? So, um, um, I think these objections based on things that Descartes didn't know about or imagine, uh, there could be something important there. But um, on the other hand, it could be just us thinking, oh, since we have all this cool stuff, we must know better than Descartes, <laughs> which would be a mistake, right? So that's basically why I'm discouraging it. Uh, Okay. Please write the number of the argument you have chosen at the beginning of your paper. You don't need to quote it. Um, I guess people often quote it just because they, they want to take up more space. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's uh, just write the number. If you don't write the number, presumably, if you've done the assignment well, we could still be able to figure out which one you're doing. Oh, uh, okay. But it's convenient to write the number. All right. Are there questions about that? Okay. Yes. Should the objection be only your own or somebody else's objection that you reference? Oh, I mean, it could be somebody else's objection. You mean like... Should we look for objections or think of objections? Uh, the idea is to think of an objection. Yeah, you think of your own objection. If you happen to know, you know, but like those objections are going to be harder to answer, presumably, right? Like if you happen to know what Kant or Nietzsche or something says about Descartes, then that's going to be uh, interesting, but probably much harder to, to imagine how Descartes would respond. Yeah. Uh, should we take into consideration the whole Catholic Church and everything and within his arguments, or what should we take into consideration the Catholic Church? You mean, or like its influence on his arguments? Uh, and you mean as far as the objection or the response? So yeah. I guess in theory, the objection could be Descartes, this is heretical because it undermines transubstantiation or something like that. I, don't, I haven't I usually I seen students raise that kind of objection. But. Well, like the objection I thought of just now that I think is relevant to the question is like Descartes is very concerned about the, the all deceiving demon, right? A question you could raise to him is, what makes you so sure that the Catholic God isn't something that the all-deceiving demon is making you believe? And his Catholic faith is obviously very significant in how he would respond to that. Okay, well, I'm going to talk about some issues related to that in a moment, so maybe you should hold that thought. But... Um, um, I mean... But I will say that there's, uh, um, there aren't, this is not quite as clear as it is in Locke, but I think it's, I think it's pretty true for Descartes too. There aren't things where he, maybe it's actually clearer for Descartes than Locke. Locke will often, you know, quote a vis, uh, biblical verse or something, right, in support of his opinion. But then if you look carefully, you'll always see that there's also an argument, <laughs> right, um, that he's not really basing himself on the biblical verse. Descartes doesn't even do that, right? Descartes doesn't cite the Bible or Augustine or, you know, any kind of truth, uh, church authority in favor of his views. Um, and he presumably wouldn't use it in a response to an objection either, unless he were being, of course, accused of heresy, in which case he might, you know, use it to show that it wasn't heretical. But um, 
But I mean, I, yeah, so I mean, I think he would treat a religious objection as a serious objection that has to be answered, but I don't think he would respond by by basing himself on church authority. Um, but okay, again, it might be a little bit clearer when I talk about, we're gonna start, start, start talking about this in a moment because I'm gonna outline the entire first meditation first, but are there other questions about the assignments? Yeah. Uh, so for the correct response, should we limit ourselves to things that he wrote in the meditations or should we make inferences about yeah, you, you won't be able to respond probably by just quoting the meditation. Yeah, this is like, yeah, this is a little bit, this is how philosophers read. I think I mentioned this before, although it's hard to remember what I, there's certain things I say over and over in every class, but <laughs> right, that, you know, philosophers, when they, when they read a philosophical text, they're always asking, like, but what would they say if you asked? And I've heard at least that historians find that very irritating. <laughs> They're like, that didn't happen. Why should you talk? Why are you talking about that? <laughs> but but for reading a philosophical text, that's like for, as a philosopher, that's one of the most important things. You're right. You're always asking yourself, what what would Descartes say if you asked this? Um, um, so like. You can't know for sure, obviously, uh, but you're um, you're trying to come up with something plausible, and it's you know, so it's going to be based on the things he says. For example, it should be consistent with the things he says, but uh, but you might be able to say it without quoting anything. Okay. I hope that makes it clearer. If not, easy. <laughs> yeah. This is more like a like just a logistical question after reading. If I'm reading the translation that's from Google Books, are the page numbers that you assigned like are the readings going to line up with that book or no? No, but the readings are so like the reading for today was the first meditation. Right. So that you just have to find where that is in the edition you're using. Um, the, I think the only exception to that is going to be that the second meditation I've broken into two pieces, but I think in the syllabus it says it gives a paragraph number oh, yeah. to stop. Um, yeah, and you'll see it's basically a pretty uh, good stopping place. It's right after the cognito argument. What it's called. All right. Um, okay, more questions? Yeah, and I mean, in fact, even if you're using the ebook version, as people were telling me last time, it doesn't have any page numbers. So obviously the page numbers are not going to match. Um, but I think everything on the syllabus, I mean, I did this, I tried to do this deliberately before so people could use other editions, that everything on the syllabus, although it gives page numbers, it also gives some other way of telling. Um, Okay, on to, yes. Um, so for our, um, for his uh, response to our objection, should we frame it as um, like, I believe this is what Descartes, I believe Descartes would respond or um, Descartes would probably respond. Yeah, Descartes might respond. Yeah, whatever, something like that. Um, All right, other questions? Then, okay, so, um, all right. So the first meditation is very short, but nevertheless, I have pro probably more than an hour and a half of stuff to say about it. <laughs> so, um, so my plan is <laughs> to first, put up a general outline of how the, the structure of the first meditation, then make some general remarks about the meditations and the first meditation in particular, and then discuss the argument of the first meditation in detail. 
but I know from experience that I probably won't finish the last part, <laughs> which is why I have the first part. So at least I'll have said something about the whole first meditation. Um, so, um, so there's basically five, possibly six parts. Um, by the way, I guess I should say, I mentioned counting paragraph numbers. I'm not sure if all editions have the same paragraph. I think that they're not in the first edition, the paragraph. You should still be able to tell this, but if anyone's confused, it's only that one. I think it's only this, the, where the second meditation breaks is the only issue. And it's basically right after the meditator proves that they exist, but before they start asking, what is it now that I prove to exists? Which is most, that's most of the second meditation. So the, the first reading from the second meditation is very, very short. And it's just that one famous argument that's often summarized as I think therefore I am. Although those words are those words are in the discourse, but they're not in the meditation. But um yeah, so that, that's the first reading and the second reading is the rest of the second meditation. Okay. Okay, so just in case the paragraph breaks me up. Okay, so anyway, here's and I was reminded of that because I'm going to give paragraph numbers for here, but again, possibly your mileage might vary. Um, so the first part is the first two paragraphs. And it's basically about why and how to dismantle all the things. So um, the why part is kind of like in one sentence, everything that he said in the discourse, I think. And the how part is, um, I mean, uh, because in the first paragraph, he it looks like um, the meditator is gonna need to reject all their old beliefs. I'll say something more after I finish this outline about why I'm careful to distinguish between the meditator and their product. The person who's speaking, I call them meditator. <laughs> All right. So the meditator is talking about um, at, in the, at the end of the first paragraph, it looks like they're going to have to reject all their old beliefs, which looks like um, an impossible project for two reasons. First of all, it seems like they're going to have to prove that all their old beliefs are false, which, of course, how could you do that? Right? Like the thing about uh, contradictions that I was talking about last time will only get you as far as one of them is false. <laughs> but you have to prove they're all false. <laughs> um, that's really impossible. And moreover, there's too many of them. Right? So that's why in the second, paragraph, the meditator um, quickly shrinks down the project to saying, first of all, I only have to find some reason to doubt each of my old beliefs. I don't have to prove they're all false. Um, I mean, in a way that's kind of obvious, but it shows how careful the progress of this text is here, that, that Descartes has the meditator explicitly go through that step. <laughs> Um, so I only have to find some reason for doubt, so to dismantle or overturn, um, um, to like evert this <laughs> like overturn all my old opinions means to find some reason for doubting them, not to show that they're all false. And number two, uh, the meditator says, Moreover, I just have to find the foundations on which all the other opinions rest. And if I can just cast doubt on those, then all the others will spontaneously collapse. Um, right, like that is taking up again the metaphor from the discourse of tearing down a house. To tear down a house, you could take each, let's say it's made of bricks, you could take each brick out individually starting from the top, and that would take a long time. Or you could undermine the foundation and the whole thing will fall down. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so what are the foundations, right? That's what raises the question, what are the foundations? And in paragraphs three through five, the assumption is that the foundation is the census, right? The third paragraph starts by saying, you know, like, namely, everything I have taken to be most true up until now has come through the senses or by the senses, something like that. Um, so that's the foundation. If I can cast doubt on um, the trustworthiness of the senses in general, then everything else will collapse. Um, now, of course, this position is empiricist. <laughs> Right, that the senses are the foundation. So the meditator actually starts off as an empiricist. It only lasts for a few paragraphs. <laughs> but um, uh, so, I mean, therefore, you can already tell that there's a distinction between the meditator and Descartes in this sense. But the things the meditator is saying in the first meditation are not Descartes considered opinions. They're someone's old opinions. Um, whether they whether they're Descartes' old opinions as a matter of biography is less clear. It's probably more like they Descartes thinks they're your old opinions. <laughs> the re Right. Um, but so in any case, that's what happens in these paragraphs. And by the end of paragraph five, the census have been totally eliminated as a basis for knowledge. And the final blow in the coffin is the dreaming argument, the famous dreaming argument. All right. Um, and then, So, uh, so it's important to notice what happens here. So, like, I mean, a certain kind of skeptic at this point would say, well, all right, so I don't know any, my, my knowledge of external objects, which I thought was based on the senses, is all not trustworthy. But I know there are sense data. Right? That would be the fallback. Um, and in a way, that would still be empiricist, right? Like if you think of Barclay as an empiricist, well, for those who, I guess some people have 100 C and others have, but, um, but in any case, that's kind of a natural move for us, I think, or I don't know about, at least for us philosophers. <laughs> um, that's kind of a natural move, but Descartes doesn't do that. because Not because Descartes doesn't believe in something like sense data, something like sense data, but because um, that wasn't, that's not part of our old beliefs, right? That's actually a technical thing that he's gonna introduce in the second meditation. In the first meditation, the fallback is um, reason, basically, right? So it's mathematics, pure mathematics. Um, right, there's pure mathematics as opposed to, for example, astronomy, which people used to think of as a branch of mathematics, but it's applied, right? It's not pure. Um, so um, pure mathematics and um, other kinds of rational knowledge, metaphysics, perhaps. Doesn't really mention this separately yet, but it will come up later in this meditation. Um, so 
this is a rationalist position, right? And so here, the issue between Descartes and the meditator is the other way around. In the end, Descartes is gonna say, this is the basis of my knowledge, right? But at this point, the meditator finds a reason to doubt. Um, I guess I'm just noticing now there's kind of asymmetry in the way I've set up these pieces. Because this is both saying that the foundation is the senses and refuting it. But here I'm saying this is like um, saying that the foundation is reason. That is arguing that no, there is a foundation that's, or that there is a foundation that's left over after this dismantling is done, namely reason. And then my next part, on part four is to cast doubt on this. And for that purpose, he brings in as one of his old beliefs the existence of God. There's actually, I would say there's two parts to this. So one is God. So this is one of his old beliefs, or it's one of the reader's old beliefs. At least, I mean, it is one of Descartes' old beliefs, but that's um, this is one of his of, of your old beliefs, and so you can use it to undermine other beliefs, and that's what it's brought in for. Right. So at this point, the existence of God is brought in as a reason for doubt. Um, at the beginning of the third meditation. Descartes says, so for those few people, boy, I really am not going to do this ebook thing next time. <laughs> for those few people who have the same text as me, it's on page 88. Um, and since I have no cause to think there is a deceiving God, and I do not yet even know for sure whether there is a, a God at all, any reason for doubt which depends simply on this belief is a very slight and, so to speak, metaphysical one, right? So at, at the beginning of the third meditation, he's referring back to this reason for doubt and saying that it's the, it's the slightest because um, he hasn't really proved that there is a God. And even if there is, there's no reason to think God is deceiving. Yeah. So wait, did he just say there that um, he, he said like metaphysics has like not good reasoning for the existence of God? I, you know, I'm not sure in exactly what sense he's using the term metaphysical there. I, I, but, but, but what he's talking about there is not arguing using metaphysics for the existence of God. He's saying the existence of God is a metaphysical reason for doubt. Mm -hmm. Again, the argument we're talking, I mean, he is in the rest of the third meditation, he is going to use the existence of God in a positive way to prove something. But at this point, he's using it in a negative way as a reason for doubt. And what he's saying at the beginning of the third meditation is um, that as reasons for doubt go, it's slight. Um, and then part two of this argument is without God. <laughs> now, like this part is put in the third person, I think for good reason. Right? He, that is, at this point, the meditator says, um, Perhaps there may be some who would prefer to deny the existence of so powerful a God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. Right, that is the meditator never says straight out, although from that remark in the third meditation, you can tell that it's true. The, never, the meditator never says straight out, and now I'm going to doubt the existence of God. Why? You're not supposed to doubt that, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, 
you're not supposed to de deliberately suppress your faith. <laughs> well, that's right. So, I mean, I think Descartes probably has an understanding of what faith is, perhaps not as different from Kant as you might think, a practical understanding, such from his point of view, there's no problem here, but he still doesn't want his meditator to say it. <laughs> so the meditator never says, I'm gonna doubt the existence of God, but instead the meditator says, perhaps there may be some, <laughs> right? So this, the argument that goes on at this point is put in the mouth of someone else. And this other person is doubting the existence of God or at least of so powerful a God, right? Um, why? Because they wanna shore up their, their other beliefs. Because again, God is put in here as a reason for doubt. So this, like atheist or like less theist, <laughs> less powerful, God is all we need, is all they need, um, is doing that in, in order to reestablish certainty. It's saying, oh, but you know, maybe this is the thing that's wrong and not this. <laughs> right? So, um, but then the meditator says, oh, well, if there's no powerful God, then you're created by something less perfect than God. And therefore you're more likely to be deceived. <laughs> right, so in other words, it turns out that if you go all the way through this step, now like whether the argument is good or not is another question, but if you go all the way through this step, um, um, Descartes ends up saying, whether you believe in God or not, I found a reason to undermine this. Um, but carefully in such a way that um, um, he or his character never actually have to say, okay, let me try not to believe. All right. Um, so, at, at this point, the, the actual argument is over, right? Like, I mean, you put these two things together and I could be wrong about anything, basically, um, is what the argument is supposed to show by this point. So why doesn't the first meditation end there? Well, so there's at least one other part, and this is the part about the demon. This is... Uh, uh, end of paragraph 10, paragraph 11 to 12. Okay, paragraph 11 to 12. Right? So why does this demon come in? So first of all, this demon is not a reason for doubt. It's not a real reason for doubt. Why? It's not one of his old opinions. It's not one of anyone's old opinions, but there's a super powerful demon who's like doing its best to deceive me about everything. We have no reason to believe that. So as a reason for doubt, it would be no good. Right, as opposed to the type of reasons that do come in here, like sometimes I've found that the senses deceive me. Um, I know that I dream at night and I think absurd things are true. Um, you know, uh, and either God exists or I'm created by something less perfect. <laughs> okay. Those are all things that I originally, that I, that I believed before. This is just an, a complete fiction. So why does it come in here? Well, the meditator says, because the, the conclusion of this is that I should doubt all of my old opinions, at least a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, as we said way back at the beginning, technically that's enough, right? Like all we need to do is find some reason for doubting all the old beliefs. Um, in order to start out, to look for something that's certain and start over. But the meditator says, but it's but as long as I keep considering all my old beliefs as what they really are, namely 
in some way dubious, but nevertheless, um, highly probable. <laughs> Um, as long as I start, as I continue to think about all my, all my old beliefs that way, then they're going to, without my noticing it, sneak back in and influence me. So I have to pretend, even though the project was not to show that they're all false, because that would be impossible. I'm going to pretend that I've shown they're all false. I'm going to pretend that I know that all my old beliefs were false. And in order to remind myself of that fiction, I invent this other fiction of a demon that's deceiving me. That's how the demon comes in. You see on the canvas page, I had um, Dali draw a scene of like something like Descartes study with an evil genie turning into another genie. <laughs> yeah. Are the beliefs about uh, God's existence? Uh... Descartes or only the med meditators? Well, it's a little bit hard to answer because, I mean, okay, so first of all, like there were people who accused Descartes of atheism. When, when, when you read the meditations, I think you'll see that that's a difficult case to make, but, uh, um, but, uh, there were people who thought that. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't think that's right. Uh, so um, so therefore, Descartes, yes, believes in the existence of something he calls God. He says carefully what that is. <laughs> and he thinks that's what you should mean by God. Uh, Meaning, I guess, although I don't think he thought about biblical interpretation very much, unlike Spinoza. Um, meaning, I guess, that if you interpreted the Bible correctly, you would see that it's about that thing that Descartes is talking about. Or if you interpreted church doctrine correctly, I don't know. But in any case, so, but the question is, is what the meditator invokes at this point the same thing that Descartes, that the mature Descartes looking back from the end believes or has the course of the argument actually changed the meditators understanding of what the what their belief in God entails so what it so you, you see what I'm the difficulty on so like for example in the case of the existence of physical objects um it's going to turn out that but so to begin with, of course, the meditator believed, as we all believe, that there are things like books and chalk and whatever, right? And at the end of the sixth meditation, the meditator will prove that indeed there are things like that, only it will turn out that they're completely different than we thought they were. <laughs> right? That they're not the kind of things that, let's say, Aristotle was trying to explain how they could be, but something really different and weird. <laughs> so similar, so so like if similarly, you could suspect that what is meant by God might change between this point and the third meditation and group. Um, Having said that, I'm not sure I would want to argue that in this case. It's, I guess it depends how you look at it. I mean, so it's going to turn out that the idea that God is a deceiver is like a contradiction in terms. Um, so maybe we should say that at the point where the meditator is considering that maybe God is deceiving them, that according to Descartes, they're not really thinking about God. They're not clearly thinking about God. Um, all right. Sorry, that was a really long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, the thing about the, the the thing about God is really important in all three of these people, and yet it's also very potentially misleading. I'm going to say more about this as we go on, but no. Um, 
I mean, here's just here's like one quick way to 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 see why it's misleading. If you ask why do why are philosophers always talking about God? <laughs> um, and you know that holds even for atheist philosophers like Nietzsche, <laughs> right? Why are they always talking about God? Um, is it because of the church? Is it because of it's because of Plato and Aristotle? <laughs> Plato and Aristotle talk about God, so of course all philosophers do, right? <laughs> um, so it's um, um, and yet obviously living in Christian Europe and um, at least in Descartes and Leibniz's case is trying in some sense to be. Um, Orthodox Christians, not Orthodox with a capital R, right? Not like deep Orthodox, but <laughs> trying to, to have correct beliefs. Uh, that that you know that does that complicates it and brings in all kinds of political considerations and whatever. But that's also misleading because the political considerations may not be the same ones that are familiar to us. All right. So I don't know, that's all I'm gonna say about it for now because I wanted to go on to, so is there a sixth part? I mean, there sort of is, the sixth part is like the very end of the last paragraph where, um, right? So the thing about the demon ends like this. I shall stubbornly and firmly persist in this meditation. And even if, it's, if it is not in my power to know any truth, I shall at least do what is in my power. That is, resolutely guard against assenting to any falsehoods, so that the deceiver, however, this is kind of a loose translation, so that the deceiver, however powerful and cunning he may be, will be unable to impose on me in the slightest degree. Right? So that's like finishing the use of this demon. I'm going to use the demon to remind myself not to rely on any of my old opinions. But then there's this like postscript. But this is an arduous undertaking and a kind of laziness brings me back to normal life. I am like a prisoner who is enjoying an imaginary freedom while asleep. As he begins to suspect that he is asleep, he dreads being woken up and goes along with the pleasant illusion as long as he can. In the same way, I happily slide back into my old opinions and dread being shaken out of them. Okay, dread being woken. That's good. Okay. For fear that my peaceful sleep may be followed by hard labor when I wake, and that I shall have to toil not in the light, but amid the inextricable darkness of the problems I have now raised. Right? So this is, I mean, First of all, this is like part of the plot of the meditations, although it doesn't say this. Um, uh, we, we can tell from the beginning of the second meditation that this happened at night. And in the beginning of the second meditation, the meditator starts talking about the arguments I made yesterday. <laughs> so like the meditator is literally gonna go to sleep. <laughs> um, but there's also some kind of metaphor about sleep and waking and whatever, hard labor in the dark. Um, uh, I don't think that's like just a, well, can I say? It is just a metaphor, but it might be a metaphor for something important. Okay. Um, There's a passage in Thoreau. This is the beginning of chapter 16 of Walden. After a still winter night, I awoke with the impression that some question had been put to me, which I had been endeavoring in vain to answer in my sleep as what, how, when, where. But there was dawning nature in whom all creatures live, looking in at my broad windows with serene and satisfied face and no question on her lips. I awoke to an answered question to nature and daylight. <laughs> All right, so Thoreau's thinking about this, but I don't understand Thoreau, so 
<laughs> that's as much as I can tell you for now. All right. Anyway, um, so that's the that's the end of my outline of the first meditation. Are there questions about that? Yeah. Do you think that the last part is an acknowledgement that this whole practice of meditation um, is is not always possible for people? Like it is a luxury to sleep and dream instead of labor, right? Right. About, although, but here the the labor is the meditation. Mm. Sleeping and dreaming is not. Mm. So if I were to go out and work hard all day to make a living, that would be a way of staying asleep. <laughs> He's an asshole. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't think so, but you're entitled to your opinion. Anyway, um, right, so I don't think it means exactly that. Um, but um, does it does mean, yeah, that first of all, it does, it, it does mean that there's a practice of meditation. Yeah. And it's difficult. Um, and that's how it's being suggested that you could use the text. I think. Mm -hmm. um, take a break at this point. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's I think that's one of the things that going that's going on, but I think there's more to it that I mean. But you know, another word for waking up is enlightenment. <laughs> so um, uh, this thing about being asleep and waking up has, you know, potentially has deep implications. Using the whole dream stuff before too. Yeah, it is. It 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 is it is confusing what the relationship between this dream and this dream is. Because one of them is true and one is, yeah. Well, so no, I mean, I think one of the ways to put this is that the end of the meditation is it's going to turn out that I was dreaming in a sense. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, you know, um, and that's why I shouldn't be an empiricist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In like the second um, part of that, like for the first dream, is that more like a lull where it's just like this? Is almost like a dream because you're choosing to like stay in that bliss. And then it's six talking more about how you have to acknowledge the dream through like be it like through the demon telling you that this is a dream and waking up. Well, I mean, here the dream actually isn't nice, right? I mean, here the dream is, you know. Um, well, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, there's two, there's different dreams being discussed here. Um, it's true in the end, he talks about a dream where a dream of sitting in the nightgown, in a nightgown by the fire and whatever. I guess that'd be the kind of pleasant dream you wouldn't want to wake up from. Um, although what you're really doing is lying in bed. So I don't know if that, yeah, but it, but you know, but the introduction to this is by way of the the uh, insane people who think that they're made of glass and stuff like that, and those are not. It's possibly an allusion to a story by Cervantes about someone thinking made of glass, but I'm not sure. But uh, but um, right, like. Thinking you're made of glass is a bad situation to be in because you're afraid that you're going to break, right? Or thinking your head is a pumpkin or whatever. <laughs> the various things that um, I guess, no, I guess, well, some of them actually, some of the insane people, like some of them think they're kings when they're actually poor. And... There's something that's about social class it's more relevant. Way that one of the ways you can be deceived is to think you're a, a king and you're actually poor. It might, you know, it might again come out at the end of the meditation that that's what happened to that's what happened to kings. 
Who are the people we call kings? They're dreaming with their cheeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, according to Colin Descartes' logic, can you consider uh, the waking world to be more real than um, the dreaming one, even uh, even though uh, that, I mean, is there reasoning outside of us, outside of our own senses? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, again, in the sixth meditation, um, basically the, the coming meditations are gonna reverse this progress, <laughs> right? They, like the, the, the second meditation establishes a point of certainty. The third meditation proves that God exists. The um, fourth meditation is about error. But the fifth meditation proves that reason is reliable. And the sixth meditation explains in what sense the sensible world exists, and right, and in what sense it's true that the that, that the things that are revealed by the senses are really there. And it, it is true. Uh, Descartes explains how you can tell that you're not dreaming. It's it's not very like complicated. It's just like you know, if everything fits together, <laughs> then that's not a dream. Um, so it goes gives a way of showing of knowing that you're not dreaming. It doesn't necessarily work to tell if you are dreaming, I think, but. Any case, I'm not sure if all of that answered your question, but okay. I, again, like it, again, it's super important to remember that the purpose of all this skepticism is not to end in doubt, but to reestablish belief in the world on a firm basis. And in, in some ways, the world is going to be different than we thought it was, but there is going to be a world. <laughs> um, I mean, it's like color isn't going to be in it anymore, for example. <laughs> but uh, the bodies we think of as colored are there. It's just we're mistaken to think of them as color in some sense. All right. I, more questions about that should probably wait until we go on our meditations. Um, okay. Now the question is... How much so I wanted to talk about now is sort of this is all the notes I wrote I wrote today that weren't in my old notes because it's stuff I've been thinking about since the last time I taught this class. So I have like on the one hand I'm particularly attached to them, but on the other hand, maybe I should skip over them quickly. <laughs> um so uh but I mean so one thing that's that's important and that I you know was in my old notes too is that there's a difference. So right now I'm making general remarks about the meditations. That's what I'm doing now. Then I'm going to go back, hopefully, and talk about these steps in more detail. But I probably won't get to all of them. Right. So, um, so the first general remark that's really important is about the genre of the meditations. Um, and it's different than the discourse. Right? So the discourse is nonfiction. Like, um, meaning, of course, just that something is nonfiction doesn't mean it's true. And just that something is fiction doesn't mean it's false, actually. <laughs> but the relationship between them and truth and falsehood is different, right? So, like, if it's not true that Descartes went to one of the best schools in Europe, then the discourse is wrong. It's a lie, right? But if it's not true that, um, Descartes, and what, how should we think of this now? That Descartes, as he writes the meditations, is sitting by the fire in a dressing gown with a lump of wax and whatever. I guess the lump of wax is, arrives on the next day. It's probably already there. But anyway, um, but if, if, if all that stuff is not true, it doesn't affect the meditations at all. It's a story. I mean, of course, uh, certain things like general arguments and whatever have to be correct or else the meditations are wrong. But the way it describes like matters of fact in the world, as you say, is like, it, it makes no claim that those things are true. It's a fiction. 
um, I guess you could say, well, um, how do I know that? Well, like I said, if the if we were going to take the meditations as nonfiction, I guess we would have to, first of all, we would have to take the person who's speaking as definitely Descartes, right? Because it says I. <laughs> so we would have to take the person speaking to be Descartes. And what they said would be true, well, first of all, only, as, as I said, if Descartes was actually doing the stating things as he wrote, sitting by the fire or whatever. Um, but the further implication of that is that the whole text would have to be a kind of stream of consciousness record of his thought, right? Now, I mean, you can read it that way, but when you're reading it that way, you are you have to keep in mind that it's a fiction. Why? Well, I mean, this couldn't be a stream of consciousness record of his thought as he was writing the meditations, because, I mean, uh, to give just, I think, the clearest way of knowing that he wrote the discourse before he wrote the meditations and in i think chapter five of the discourse one of the chapters we didn't read he summarizes the argument of the meditations right so he already knew the argument before he started writing it so it's not like it's not like as descartes is writing it he's surprised by where he ends up <laughs> he knows where he's going and he's writing in you know deliberately to get there I mean, I think like if you read it, you shouldn't need the that evidence about the discourse to conclude that, right? Like reading this text, you can tell this is not a stream of consciousness record of someone's thought. No one thinks this way, not even they <laughs> right? It's it's carefully put together. Um So that means that the meditator, at the very least, isn't the real Descartes, right? Like, if we think of the meditator as Descartes, we have to think of the meditator as a fictional version of Descartes, right? Descartes is telling a story about himself, we, you know, which you can do. You can tell a fictional story about yourself. Um, um. I remember I once had to go to a preschool class. I think, why was this? I think it was for my daughter's birthday or something. For some reason, they wanted my wife and I to, to say how we first met. So like I said, well, it was a long time ago. There were dinosaurs. <laughs> I started telling a story like that about how we met, right? So, the, so the I in that story referred to me, but it's fiction, <laughs> right? So that's what the, the if we think of, the, of Descartes as a meditator at all, it's the meditator as Descartes as all. It's like that, but you know maybe the meditator isn't Descartes, um, even a fictional Descartes. Why do I say that? Well. One reason is that the meditator seems to be reading rather than writing. Right, the meditator mentions um, holding a piece of paper in their hand. Um, and looking at it. At the moment, my eyes are certainly wide awake when I look at this piece of paper. Yeah, I mean, what I'm about to say is not really a super strong argument. It's just like one of the things that made me start thinking this way. And I don't know if I have a super strong argument, <laughs> but it is but it is a way you can think about it anyway. I mean, a lot of other, I, I do know this, that a lot of other philosophers, when they write similar passages, there's a pen and ink. Like there's a passage in Locke where there's a paper and a pen and ink. And there's a passage in Husserl, it's all about an ink bottle, right? And there's no, there's no ink. There's no pen and ink in the meditations. It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> so the meditator, I feel like the meditator is reading the meditations. <laughs> like that is the meditations and maybe they've received the meditations as a letter actually, because as I said, later we're gonna see there's a lump of wax. Where did that come from? Yeah. Um, I think I'm a little confused on how to know it's the uh how to know when it's Descartes speaking and how to know when it's the 
It's the med figure is the is the discourse part and then the meditation part is Descartes. No, that's the other way around, right? The discourse is Descartes writing nonfiction about himself. And again, by saying nonfiction, I don't necessarily, although I don't have any reason to think he's lying, but okay. right, but he's uh, but he's claiming to tell the truth about himself. Right. The meditations, I think, is is like for the reasons I gave and more, I think like at least a careful reader is supposed to realize off the bat, obviously, uh, this is a fiction. Okay. So everything it says in the meditations is the meditator speaking. I mean, that is, it's Descartes speaking, it's Descartes writing in the voice of the meditator. But I just suggested a weird complication to that, which is that Descartes is, so to speak, writing the meditator's thoughts for them. <laughs> Ray that is like has written down these thoughts and sent it to the meditator as a letter, and the meditator is now reading it. And the and the, the thoughts are like, I am now holding this paper. <laughs> right? Like if you imagine getting a letter that says you are now looking at this paper, <laughs> but it's something like that. Yeah. So to like if we wanted to properly read this as the meditator. Should we get like a, a dressing gown and sit in front of a fire and get all cozy and start reading the you know, the first meditation? And the lump of wax. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have to get a lump of wax too and start letting it out on the table, which if you live in university housing, they won't thank you for doing that. Yeah. They're a nice desk. I think, um, I think it's enough to imagine it. <laughs> I don't think you have to actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that the meditator, well, this is what they already were sort of asking, but do you think that the medita uh, meditator serves as an audience surrogate? Like the meditator is us as much as they can be? I think uh, that's that's like, that's the more reasonable stage of what I think. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> yes. There's a less reasonable stage where I start thinking that the meditator is Francine. <laughs> That's, but that I can't really, I can't really justify that. That's fun though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if the meditator is a sort of, as the subject of the text, is a sort of like fictionalized reader receiving these meditations in, a, in the fashion of letters. Can we assume that the letters are from a fictional Descartes, or is there like a further phantom person involved here? Like, <laughs> like, like uh, that's a good Plato question. Plato always puts his opinions in the mouth of Socrates, right? So, is Maybe. Descartes speaking to the meditator as himself, or are these letters like, I don't know, are they from Aristotle? I okay. I mean, that's a good question. I you know. And if we were talking about Plato or Kierkegaard, I would say absolutely that's the right question to ask. With Descartes, I don't feel like there's that level of complication, but I could be wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Plato, when you say that Plato puts, I mean, Socrates is certainly not the same as Plato. Right? Like Socrates didn't take money for teaching philosophy. Plato did. Socrates was put to die. Plato wasn't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things come up in the dialogues. <laughs> so whether they have the same opinions or not or not is a different question. Whether you can whether Socrates always has the same opinion, whether whether you can tell what Socrates' real opinion is. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, this course is not about Plato. Um <laughs> okay, back to Descartes. Um Right. I mean, one of the other uh, of the other of these ways of thinking about it is relevant to something that is it's always in the background of the meditations, but it's hard to deal with directly, which is that when we do reverse this process, it's going to be unclear, I guess, in part because like, so at what point here did the meditator doubt the existence of other people? Like of other minds, as we suppose. So there isn't a clear place where that happens. They did have to retreat by themselves. They're by themselves when they're reading, writing, or reading this. 
Um, and uh, there's one point where they look out the window and think that the people they see could be automatons. That's coming later. But um, but there's no clear point where the doubt is raised, and there's no clear point where it's answered. But I guess the question is, who is the one mind and who is the other mind? <laughs> like one way of thinking of this then would be that the other mind is Descartes. The, the, the only other mind that the meditator has evidence of now is Descartes. And the question would be whether they should believe in Descartes. <laughs> uh, but um, should I read this? I, I have to. So I have to say I don't know if this is a promise or a threat, but pro, like this lecture is weirder than most of the other lectures I'm going to make in the course. I mostly st stick to trying to explain arguments and whatever. But this kind of stuff is always in the background. Um, but yeah, let me just, so this is something from Nietzsche. <laughs> um, it's from the Gay Science, <laughs> which is a great title for a book. Anyway, <laughs> um, I am forever again making the same making the same discovery, having the same experience. The word he actually uses here is erfarum, which is, means experience. And even so, always resisted anew. I do not want to believe it, although I grasp it in my hands, that the great majority of people lack an intellectual conscience. Indeed, it would often seem to me as if, with the demand of such a conscience, one would be in the most populous city as lonely as in the desert. Right, so Nietzsche is also thinking about Descartes when he writes that. Right, remember what Descartes said about being in Amsterdam, right? And I guess he's suggesting that the meditations might find no appropriate reader, and in that case, Descartes is alone. And it doesn't reach Francine, because she died when she was five years old before it was published. <laughs> But uh, but does it but but does it reach us? It might depend on whether we have an intellectual conscience, as Nietzsche puts it. Um, all right. Um, we might think that having an intellectual conscience is similar to the essential attribute that the meditator is going to identify in themselves, which is desiring certainty, but knowing that they don't have it. <laughs> OK. Um, that, that's, the, that's the weirdest part. Other questions about the weird part before I go on to the less weird? <laughs> yes. But what exactly do you mean by like um, intellectual conscience? Like like uh, how we understand, how we usually use consci conscience? Uh, so the, your question is, what does Nietzsche mean by it? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the German word for conscience is listen, which, So it has, like, this part is about knowledge, right? Like, this leads to know. Um, but this in shop is science. Um, and the Wustwein, which comes from the same root, is consciousness. Conscious is gewissen. So uh, it's, I guess it's like genoin, <laughs> except the complication is that gewiss means certain. Like the adjective give this means certain. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, so I like Nietzsche is somehow playing with that, I believe, in that passage, but I don't know if I can put it together right like then. Uh, whatever next time I teach 108 is, maybe I'll take <laughs> you can ask me more about Nietzsche and I'll be responsible for it. All right. <laughs> um 
Okay, other questions? Yes. Um, but it is doubting of people fall under like the census, just only like evidence we have for other crimes. Well, but I mean, the conclusion is going to turn out to be right. But like the subtitle of the title of the meditations is Meditations on First Philosophy. First philosophy is the phrase that Aristotle uses for what later people call metaphysics. Right. So meditations on first philosophy in which the existence of God and the distinction of the soul from the body are demonstrated. So yeah, so but in the sixth meditation, the meditator is also going to show that the mind is and the body are separate substances. This is the famous doctrine of Cartesian dualism, substance dualism. So that means that assuming that we know about that we know about through the senses, well, I mean, we don't really know about things through the senses, but what we sort of know about through the senses is bodies, then minds are a whole different issue. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's not addressed. Um, okay, how much time do I have left? 25 minutes. Um, okay, but some of the stuff I already said, that I have in my detailed notes. So let's see. Some of it I even said last time. Um, okay. Um, like, for example, the reminder that the first paragraph starts out, but makes this transition very quickly from ordinary doubt, from what last time I called ordinary doubt, to um, radical doubt. It's actually not clear yet that it's doubt until the second paragraph. It starts with ordinary doubt, right? Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I accepted as true in my false in my childhood. Um, maybe a mistranslation. In the original, it's in the subjunctive. He doesn't know for sure. Well, I mean, it's more like the large number of falsehoods that I may have accepted as true in my chat. But in any case, let me just stick with the translation we have. Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. Um, right, so that's ordinary doubt. And then I realized it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundation. Uh, from first principles is what it says. Yeah, maybe, I know, maybe I should stop using this translation. <laughs> I think I, I know the original much better than the last time I had this class. <laughs> but anyway, um, start again right from the foundations if I wanted to establish an anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. So, I mean, actually, so there's three things there, right? First, there's ordinary doubt. Then there's radical doubt. And then there's the reason for radical doubt. Right, and all of those things we, we saw in the discourse at greater length. Um, the reason for radical doubt is that I want to establish something certain. But because I, I think actually the problem in the translation of the first sentence is a serious problem, although maybe you, should, you could say it this way, like, I know that I've accepted a large number of falsehoods. How? How do I know if I've accepted a large number of falsehoods? Well, again, it's because my old beliefs turned out to be inconsistent. So they can't all be right, so I must have accepted a large number of falsehoods. But I may not know which are the falsehoods. And I think that's why I have to demolish everything. Right? I can't just get rid of the falsehoods because I don't know where they might be. <laughs> um, And um, then, as I also mentioned, is clear from the discourse, 
So I guess what I should say here is not that the second sentence is radical doubt, but the second sentence proposes radical doubt as a project, <laughs> right? And we know from the discourse um, first of all, that between first thinking of this project in the stove heated room and actually carrying it out, Descartes says there were nine years in between where he got ready for it. Um, so that's also alluded to here as we go on, right? The meditator says, um, but the task looked an enormous one. And I began to wait until I should reach a mature enough age to ensure that no subsequent time of life would be more suitable for tackling such inquiries. Right, so that's those nine years. I, I set up this project, but then I realized I'm not ready for it, and so I delayed. And then he says, this is a little bit different than the story in the discourse. This led me to put the project off for so long that I would now be to blame if by pondering over it any further, I wasted the time still left for carrying it out. Um, so anyway, for the meditator, that's the reason to finally do it. I think on the theory that the meditator is the reader, you might ask, what, ha what do I do with these sentences? And I, I, I think it's um, probably supposed to discourage a certain, certain kind of reader. <laughs> like maybe you're not ready for this yet. Um, uh, not discourage them permanently, but but like encourage them to delay <laughs> trying to do this project. Um, but so in any case, um, then when we we were were finally ready to start, I mean the reason we put it off is because it seemed like such a difficult thing to do. So again, as I said before, we don't. The first meditation doesn't say, um, I might be dreaming, so everything I believed is doubtful, <laughs> theory. Right? Like you could imagine that was the first meditation. <laughs> um, but it's not because Descartes thinks that doesn't work. You need to really, um, you need to find opinions that you really hold and use them one by one to show that the whole structure is not reliable. Um, right, so that's why we, um, that's, that's why the project would be impossible if you thought you had to do it one opinion at a time. Um, right, because you would have to examine each opinion and find a reason for doubting it. You couldn't just say over and over again, I must be, I might be dreaming, I might be dreaming. You would have to look at each opinion and see, you know, why there's a reason for doubting it. So, but fortunately, we don't have to do that because we know or think we know, although it turns out that at first we're wrong, right? So but we know or think we know what the foundation is on which all the other opinions were, were based. So if we can just get to that, that will be enough. Um, and Something to keep in mind here is to, that it doesn't say here that you have to supply from the discourse, although it, I think it relies on it here without saying it, is that this project is purely theoretical. And meanwhile, it's not affecting our actions because we have this provisional morality. Right? That's why. Um, so the meditator only mentions this after the argument when the demon comes in, actually. Um, I guess 
Yeah, it really is half of paragraph 10 already that's, that's setting the stage for the demon. In view of this, I think it will be a good plan to turn my will in completely the opposite direction and deceive myself by pretending for a time that these former opinions are utterly false and imaginary. Right, that's wrong, or anyway, I don't know that. Maybe I should, you could say it's actually wrong because I still do believe pretty much. <laughs> so I don't think that they're false or imaginary. <laughs> so if I say I think they're false or imaginary, I'm deceiving myself, right? So anyway, so I turn my will in the opposite direction and deceive myself by pretending for a time that these former opinions are utterly false and imaginary. I shall do this until the weight of preconceived opinion is counterbalanced and the distorting influence of habit no longer prevents my judgment from perceiving things correctly. And here's the part I want to get to. In the meantime, I know that no danger or error will result from my plan and that I cannot possibly go too far in my distrustful attitude. This is because the task now in hand does not involve action, but merely the acquisition of, of knowledge. Right. So the idea is, um, as I argued, I was arguing, it really is in the discourse. Right. Remember, like at first, it seemed in the discourse, like maybe the reason this isn't dangerous is because it's purely private, and only public doubt would be dangerous. But I said, but if you look into it more closely, I think you'd let, you'd find that even in the discourse, the difference is really the one who's drawing here, namely. That doubt about practical questions is dangerous, but not doubt about theoretical questions. Um, and you know, um, you this this comes up right away when we get to the first reason that's suggested for doubting the senses. So the oh, and I guess I forgot to say this when I was in the middle of saying all that other weird stuff. One other thing, which is that the first meditation and the very beginning of the second meditation, at least, also contain a fiction within a fiction, namely that the meditator is kind of going back and forth with themselves. Right? So, I mean, this should be clear I'm reading it, but I know from experience that some students don't notice it or are confused by it. Right? So, like, there's what I call the doubting voice and the responding voice, right? So the meditator will raise a doubt and then give an answer to it. And then the doubting voice will come back and, and, and explain why that answer isn't sufficient or produce a new doubt that that answer does, is not sufficient. Right, so the, so the first thing the doubting voice says is, Whatever I have up till now accepted as most true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses. But from time to time, I have found that the senses deceive. And it is prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. So two things about this. One is, how, have I, how, how am I sure that the senses have deceived? Well, if you look in the... Um, beginning of the, what is this? I'm trying to write this down. I'm maybe writing it down, but now, just a moment. Oh, I wrote it down in the outline, okay. Oh no, that's not right. Yeah, no. Oh, here it is, though. So it's near the beginning of the sixth meditation. It's on page 113 in my text. Later on, however, I had many experiences which gradually undermined all the faith I had had in the senses. Sometimes towers which had looked round from a distance appeared square from close up. So it's the same method, right? How do I know that my sen the senses have deceived me? The tower can't be both round and square. So one of either when it looked round, the senses were deceiving me, or when it looked square, the senses were deceiving me.
Now, I mean, by the way, it's in order to understand that's in, that argument, it's important that we're not um, yet introducing something like sense data. Right, the idea is that the old opinion is that sensation, and this is the Aristotelian opinion, sensation is a relationship between my body and another body. Right, like remember how the fire, what happens when I fear, feel heat? The accident of heat in the fire, or we're trying to porphyry that substantial quality of heat in the fire. Anyway, the heat in the fire causes an accident of heat in my hand. That's what sense perception is. So like sense perception is a relationship between me and the tower. And the, the, the senses show me a round tower or a square tower. And one of those must be wrong. And either there isn't really a square tower or there isn't really a round tower. Right? I mean, whereas if you think of sense data, like, there's no inconsistency between seeing this picture at one time and seeing this. This is supposed to be a square tower. This is supposed to be a round tower, right? There's no inconsistency between seeing a picture of a square tower in your head at one time and a, and a picture of a round tower in your head at another time. Um, uh, the point I'm trying to make. Just that this way of there's an inconsistency because we're because our old opinion is that the senses directly reveal what objects are there. We don't kind of infer from what the senses show us what objects are there. Um, if you know, if we did, then um, these aren't inconsistent, and maybe if we were careful, we would reach the same inference from both of them. So the senses wouldn't be deceptive. But there's no like layer like this in the in the meditator's original way of thinking about it. I'm sorry, everyone's looking very much <laughs> Is there a question about this? If you don't understand what I just said, at least keep in mind that what I said about like how. The, the, it's the same principle of contradiction that's working here, right? The reason, the first reason the doubting voice gives for doubting the senses is that I know the senses have sometimes deceived me. And I think you can see from that passage in the sixth meditation how I know that. Namely, that the senses don't give consistent information. I mean, there's an argument like this in Locke. And I mean, I guess there's ancient skeptical arguments like this too. Yeah, I thought this would be a similar example, but then I thinking it over, I don't know if it is, but like you know, like when scuba dive, when you know those uh caves where divers go in, where the, the two layers of water are different, where one's like a light color and the other one's a, a dark color, and you think that when you're going up, uh, you're finally going to reach air, it turns out that you know, it's uh, just you know, more water. It's yeah, you know, I didn't know that, but okay, yeah, yeah. some people die. Yeah, some people die doing that. But that would be like the sense of deceive me and make me think that that's air. Uh, but I don't know. Is that like a similar thing? Um, because the, I mean, because the color is the, because the color is still there as like blue, it's the same color, but it's not like because that's just a like a rational thing. Yeah. About, I don't know. I mean, that example is more complicated. Uh, it's just the, I mean, the data about what it looks like doesn't change, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. Like extrapolation the reason, about it. Yeah. Well, it's, but it, yeah, I mean, when you try to read it, you find out it's not, I, I don't know. I, 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 I that, like, yeah. It produces kind of a good report because, okay, yes, on the on the one level, sense data can't be trusted because it reports inconsistently whether it's air or whether it's water. But you're very clear on what it is when when you start drowning, right? 
which arguably is also sense data. Right. So, I mean, so that's related to the next point I was going to make, right? Like at the, the end of this paragraph, it is prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. Is that true? I mean, like, suppose uh, one time I asked someone if they like my hat. Anyway, do you like my hat? And they said, oh, yes, it's a lovely hat, right? And then I found out that they didn't really like my hat, <laughs> right? And then tomorrow I'm walking along and the same person is there and they say, look out, you're about to, to step over a cliff. <laughs> is it true? Is it prudent not to trust them completely? No, it's prudent to trust them completely, right? <laughs> um, but of course, Descartes doesn't deny that, right? That's the difference between theory and practice. There would be a big danger in starting to think this way about the senses if I was going to apply it to action, right? So if I was out scuba diving, and I was like, oh, well, that way feels like up, but maybe my sense of balance is deceiving. I mean, Descartes doesn't know about sense of balance, exactly, but we, we count that as one of the yes. <laughs> maybe my sense of balance is deceiving. Maybe I should swim that way. <laughs> well, I mean, it could be true, right? Maybe somehow I've gotten discombobulated and I'm swimming down when I think I'm swimming up, but it would not be prudent to to uh, entertain that doubt, right? I should keep swimming up. Again, again, like we're, we're the only reason, if, I mean, if there's, if I have some special reason to think I'm deceived about up and down, that would be one thing. But if the only reason is my senses have once deceived me, then it would be very foolish for me to start swimming down because I, right? I mean, um, um, that would be just like if I'm trying to get out of the forest and I'm walking along this way because I think it's the right way. And then I say to myself, well, but my opinions about what's the right way have sometimes deceived me. Let me try walking this way. Okay. And I do that over and over until I have no idea where I am. <laughs> right? That would not be prudent. So, so um, this remark about it's prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once is like really only plausible because we've ruled out practice. Um, because supposedly that's taking care of itself while we do this. Even so, of course, it's not 100% clear that that's true, that it's prudent never to trust someone if they deceive you even once. It depends if the most important thing in the world is to be certain, then that's probably true. But if that's not the most important thing in the world, then even in theory, that might not be true. Yeah, did you have a question? Oh, um, I was just like wondering, does that, does that go back to like what you were saying about like how the doubt of um, practical questions is harmful, but not the doubt of, I don't know what would be so Theoretical, right. Yeah, so again, the difference between theoretical questions and practical questions is that a theoretical question, so theoria in Greek means like, in ordinary Greek, I think it meant like being a spectator, basically. Um, but uh, so, so uh, theoretical questions are questions um, asked from the point of view of what is true and what is false. Practical questions, right? So praxis in Greek means like doing stuff, right? <laughs> doing or making um, uh, is what pratein means, right? So like practical questions are questions about what I should do. So to entertain a doubt in a theoretical context is to say, well, maybe, um, what I think is true isn't really true, or what I used to think is true isn't really true. But to take it down in a practical context is to think, um, maybe what I think I should do is not really what I should do. I should do something else, right? And remember, in the discourse, 
Descartes said that at least for the purposes of this project, he was going to adopt the attitude that any in 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 a theoretical context that anything with even the slightest doubt in it would be considered false. <laughs> Right, and that's what the demon is brought in to do that. But on the other hand, he, he said in a practical con context, anything, no matter how doubtful, I'm going to consider certain. Right, and with the, and we keep it like the metaphor of being lost in the forest, right? So like the direction I pick, even if I have no reason to pick that direction, I just picked it randomly. I should still treat it as if it was absolutely certain that that was the right direction and stick to it as much as I can. I mean, of course, until I get more information, right? But, um, um, right. So, like, if Descartes were, you know, scuba diving at the time, he was thinking the meditator is like scuba diving rather than sitting in their night, you know, and they're having all these thoughts about the trustworthiness of the senses. Meanwhile, they keep swimming in the exact same way they would have before. It doesn't change the way they swim. They're going to keep swimming in the same direction. In the end, again, the, the hope is in the end that maybe this will give us new guidance to how to live our life. I mean, it might be something like um, you should sit and study philosopher rather, rather than scuba diving. <laughs> it might not be advice about scuba diving, but you know, something like that. All right. Obviously, there's a lot more to say about the first meditation, but that's all I have time for. And I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>